First major obstacle for shamatha meditation is the instability of the mind. This means that the mind is extremely unstable due to the fact that it attaches to various thoughts that come into the mind. It then gets extremely excited and involved with each thoughts in turn. In this case, the mind is focused, is extremely weak and fragile because there is a, such a high probability of thoughts influencing the state of the mind itself. It is not just that thoughts arise in the mind, but that the mind is so likely to engage with and react to those thoughts. This first obstacle is referred to as a wild or scattered mind. The untrained mind is a wild like an untamed animal in that all it takes is one thought to disturb it and away it runs. The mind is a scattered meaning that it jumps from place to place and so it cannot be placed on just one object of focus and held there for any length of time. The ability to focus the mind for more than a few moments is required for achieve beneficial results. When we attempt to meditate and find that we are confronted with the first type of obstacle, the solution or antidote to, to apply contemplation and meditation on impermanence in very specific way. First, begin by the contemplating and meditating upon the grossest examples of the impermanence. One of the most obvious is that of a new car. When we first get a new car, it is a shining and perfect. It runs smoothly and without any problems. But if we were to first forward 20 years, we could find that the same car is dented and pitted with the rust. It certainly would no longer run as well as the day we first drove it no matter how well it was maintained. It is possible that it may not run at all, but it is not as though this happened overnight. In fact, as the day passes one after the other for 20 years, we probably hardly even notice the small changes that slowly resulted in a valuable new car turning into a piece of junk. This is the simplest, simplest and grossest way of contemplating impermanence. Once we have a great spent time with this type of examples, we can then begin to refine our contemplation or meditation on impermanence by analyzing more subtle external phenomena changes that happen over centuries or millennia or even eons. We can refine this, we can refine these techniques by slowly moving to even subtler internal phenomena like thoughts, emotions. We can recognize that the thoughts that arise and the emotions, they spark are also impermanent. They come into being for a moment and then eventually they are only a memory that may someday be completely forgotten. We have saying that it's quite a common when people are in the middle of 
in unpleasant experiences. We say someday you will laugh about it. When, for example, our child draws on a wall, we immediately experience the anger or some other emotions. And it is usually someone else that says to us, someday you will laugh about it. Sure enough, when the child is grown and we think back on, on that moment, somehow it has transformed into a pleasant moment, memory that only gives us a amusement, not anger. We can spend much time contemplating the many varieties, examples of the impermanence of internal phenomena. This leads us eventually to complete confidence in the realization of the truth impermanence of all phenomena. When we contemplate the impermanence of anything, whether gross or subtle, external, internal, occupies mind in such a way that mind gradually begins to slow down. Then we can take a step back from thought that previously kept us from any experience of the tranquility in our meditation. Over time, when thoughts do rise during the course of meditation session, we tend to react less emotionally to them. And the validity and the wildness of our mind is reduced as the mind is tamed. When we no longer react to our thoughts, but instead simply observe them as they arise, then the mind has been tamed. This is a, like a horse that when wild can only do harm but when tamed can be used productively. The disciplined mind still has disturbing thoughts, but those thoughts no longer control the mind like a disease. Without thoughts, we would be dead or in an animate object. When we meditate, we are not trying to end all thoughts, but rather to end our afflicted emotions that come with our thoughts. When we captured a wild horse, we don't kill it. We tame it so that it can be used for benefit. Just so we must tame our wild minds, if we are ever to be of benefit to all beings. Using these techniques, we can overcome the first major obstacle to shamatha meditation.